Hi, everyone, and thank you for joining Crest TV's community meetup um, today. Brian and I'm going to be your host. So um, we're going to have a short introduction of ourselves first. Um, my name is Pei. Uh, I'm working on a product go to market and community for Crest TV. So I joined in September. Yeah, and I'm Brian. I think uh, some of the attendees have. I've had the pleasure of meeting already, so it's great to see that you've all joined. Um, I've been working on all of our developer documentation, um, tutorials and user guides, and then also helping out with operations in the last couple of months. So I'll be uh, I'm super excited to see you all here and we'll be presenting some, some nice showcases and feature discussions later. Cool, thanks. Yeah, so uh, just like a very shortly um, today's agenda, we're gonna, um, for the first half, we're gonna have a very short introduction of QuestDB for those who are new here or who hasn't started, get started to try QuestDB yet. And the second part will be quite special. Uh, we're able to invite um, are two of our community members as guest speakers here. And we're gonna have like uh, John, uh, who is a VP architect at Yahoo. And then we're gonna have Sean, who is a research scientist at a Bremer Institute for Production and Logistics. And the second half, we will move to the sessions where we can have open discussion about uh, one of our upcoming features, clustering, and then we're gonna have like a Q and A session where uh, all of us can ask questions. So, yeah. You're muted, Brian. Thank you. Thank you very much. So, um, to those of you who are new to QuestDB, maybe it makes sense to give you an idea of what QuestDB is. So. We're a high-performance open source database for time series data. What does that mean? So high performance in the sense that the, the team has worked for a uh, long time, making sure that uh, ingestion speeds and query speeds are low latency. Um, open source, of course, because uh, we, you know, we can, we have the whole project on GitHub. So we're, we're glad to be able to showcase development and, uh, and get community input there from, from beginning to end. Um, and for time series data, so uh, uh, most of you are familiar with what time series data is, but that's basically just tracking the changes in information over time. So some of the features of QuestDB. Um, so the, the database is partitioned by time, and that means that users can decide whether uh, tables are partitioned by year, by month, or by day. And this means that you're quite often you're you're querying data over a particular time range. And the less amount of uh, the less partitions that your queries are are touching the less you're reading from the disk. So of course, this is a lot more efficient to um, touch fewer partitions and to query. Let's say if you have, uh, uh, you're querying across three partitions over three days, this uh, is a lot more efficient in this sense. So you're not touching a year's worth of data, but only three days. Um, it's column-based storage. And that's something that, uh, even if you're you're using QuestDB already and you haven't done, I recommend you take a look at how the data is stored on the disk because that's also quite interesting to poke around in the the table data and, and see that all of the columns are uh, basically their own files. So this means if I'm doing some aggregates on a column, I'm not looking up the whole table. I just want to pick changes in a particular column over time. I'm just lifting data from this one column. Um, so this also designed designed for uh, simplicity and for performance. Yeah, one thing that's unique with QuestDB is this designated timestamp column. So typically what you would want to do here is have one timestamp column in a table, 
nominated as a designated timestamp. And this just means that you have extremely fast uh, indexing and reads on this one timestamp column. And in terms of compatibility, uh, we're using Postgres for query for uh, that people can use a lot of uh, nice integrations from Grafana data visualization tools. Um, you can also do some inserts there, but for high performance, what we use is InfluxDB line protocol. The team have worked pretty hard over the last year and a half or so to make sure that this, uh, this ingestion method is high performance. And we've published a couple of benchmarks where we've tried to push it as fast as we can on this and hit some pretty impressive speeds. And then of course, uh, we have a REST API and this is for convenience so that you can upload uh, CSV files if you wanted to, or execute some, some queries over REST. So SQL um, is the query language that QuestDB is using. And the main idea for, for using SQL is because of the ease of use. And that's one of the, the differentiators of QuestDB over a couple of other systems is that you don't have to learn a new language. If you're already familiar with SQL, there's no barrier of entry. And if you're not familiar with SQL, trust me, it's very easy to pick up. And there's a lot of uh, great resources for, for anyone to learn if that's something that's completely new to you. And then there's a few other uh, different uh, features that we've added to the database, such as the symbol data type, which is for repetitive strings. So this would be useful in cases where you have something like USD or EUR. If you're tracking crypto or financial data, then um, these repetitive string values are then stored internally as uh, integers. So it's um, more efficient to store, but also more efficient to query. So you're not doing string comparison over entire data sets. So there's uh, a lot of different features built into the system designed for uh, as accelerators for, for advanced use. And that's, uh, that's a couple of examples there. Thanks, Brian. Uh, so now we're gonna have our guest speakers. Uh, can, uh, first, we can welcome John. Brian, can you add him as a speaker, please? Sure. So just one second while we get this uh, feed sorted from John. Hi, John. Hey. Thanks so much for joining. My pleasure. So I will stop sharing my screen. And if you have some slides, feel free to, to share. Yeah, OK. I don't. You just okay. be looking at my face. Okay. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. OK, so let me just uh, uh, give some context, and I'll explain where we use Quest TV in uh, our uh, cloud system. So Vespa, I'm the architect of an engine called uh, Vespa. It's open source, it's on Vespa.ai, uh, which is a platform for uh, low latency computation over big data sets with focus on finding the right data, uh, inferring machine learning models over the data, and grouping and aggregating the data and so on, and returning responses within typically less than 100 milliseconds. So in short, it's big data plus AI plus online. Um, so we developed a platform, but we also run a cloud service that uh, uh, runs this platform as a software, uh, as a service system for a couple of hundred uh, applications. 
uh, together handling about 500 million queries uh, per second. Uh, so to run all that, we need to handle a couple of thousand physical machines and a couple of tens of thousands of uh, virtual uh, nodes that actually runs the workloads uh, of these customer applications. Uh, so part of the applications that customers develop and deploy to our system, they say uh, how many nodes they want in each of the clusters in the system and how much memory, uh, CPU, and disk, and so on. Um, and that is fine if you have a very stable workload, right? You can just figure out how much you need and then you uh, deploy with that and you're fine. But usually the world isn't that simple, right? You have variable uh, workloads and workloads that grow and shrink over time uh, uh, due to getting more data or removing old data or uh, doing more advanced machine learning functions uh, and whatnot. Right? So it's better if the system can figure out the resources you need in each of these thousands of clusters um, on its own, moment to moment, which is, of course, what we call auto scaling. Um, to do this auto scaling, we need to uh, observe all the nodes and the clusters and the applications um, so that we can make decisions that are appropriate for the load we see, uh, how much resources they're using on the machines and so on. Uh, that is collecting metrics from all these nodes, right? Um, then when we have collected all these metrics, how much are the CPU utilized on each of the nodes? How many queries do we see worldwide that goes to this cluster and so on. Then we can feed that into a model that will predict uh, the future load and how much resources we need to set aside for that future load. So that's auto scaling in a nutshell. Um, in our system, we have a control plane which consists of what we call uh, config servers that runs in each of the regions where we run our service, which is uh, about 15 data centers worldwide. Um, in each of those, we pull all the nodes for these metrics and collect them to these configuration servers, and we run the auto-scaling algorithm on those configuration servers to decide how many resources to give to each of the nodes uh, over the next uh, regulation period, which is every few minutes uh, we do this. Um, so we need to store time series data with enough history that we can make these predictions with high confidence and update them for all of these nodes and so on on each of these configuration servers and then query it while we're doing this uh, prediction. And we want to do that embedded in the configuration servers because if we do it as a third-party database, then we need to uh, care about failure modes where we can't reach this data while the configuration servers are up, which is added complexity and uh, less resilience. And we don't want this to depend on the much larger metric collection system we have for humans that needs to dig down into what the systems are doing. Because this is critical functionality that needs to work uh, all the time, absolutely all the time. So we don't want that kind of critical functionality to be dependent on the metric system for humans, because that can be allowed to be less stable. So we want to store this time series data persistently in each of these configuration servers, and we want to update it uh, all the time and query it uh, for all these thousands of clusters every few minutes to make uh, predictions about what we should do next. Uh, and that's the problem that QuestDB uh, is solving for us. We These configuration servers are Java, so we embed QuestDB inside these processes so that we know that they all run together or fail together. There's no additional uh, failure modes. And we just use the QuestDB API to write, um, to issue uh, SQL statements programmatically to uh, update the data and uh, query 
when we need to make predictions. And so far, it has been working great for us. Uh, the performance we see is really, honestly, several orders of magnitude more than we really need for this use case. But uh, it's nice to be able to grow because we want to take a lot more metrics into account as we get better at this auto scaling. Um, but the most important factor for us is that it's dead stable and never loses the data. And uh, so far, uh, it has held up well and uh, been doing the job greatly for us. So that's really what I had. Yeah, thanks a lot, John. That's, that's super interesting. Um, so I've just asked if there's any questions for John, feel free to ask in the chat. Um, but one thing that I just wanted to mention here was um, when you mentioned you're using the QuestDB API, this is through Java, right? Yeah. And this, the entire Vespa engine is also uh, open source, right? So, so people who are joining can also check out the, the GitHub repo, right? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, I think it's a, it's a super interesting use case and uh, thanks, thanks a lot for sharing. If there's no other questions, then I would move on. But um, John, thanks a lot for, for joining us. Um, it's super interesting. My pleasure. Should I click Liam or do you do something? That's no? okay. Yeah, yeah I, we can take care of it. Okay, yeah. I don't want to leave the whole thing, you know. That's okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, Okay, so quite soon we'll move on to uh, Shan from the Biba Institute. Um, and Shan, let's see, I have a request now. Should be joining us shortly. Here we go. Hi, Shan. Hello, everybody. Hello, Brian. Thanks a lot for joining. Um, yep. So I, I believe you have some slides, so I'll, exactly. I'll let, you, let you share and, and take it over. A second, please. Sure. It seems like, um, okay, I'll just start with uh, sharing my screen. Hope you can see it. Um, is it something that's visible? Uh, um, yes, I can see it now. Okay, so so hello everybody. Um, this is um, Sean from, uh, the, from the Bremer Institute of Production and Logistics. Um, I'm originally known as Shantanu. That's my that's my name on paper. But since I'm an engineer by heart, I've started to optimize uh, um, starting from my name itself. So you could definitely call me Shan, and I'll still respond. Um, I'll be presenting um, some some fun some fun quests that we've been doing in our R and D part. That's part of my work every day over here at Biba, alongside with my colleague Karthik, who's uh, who's not present, but uh, uh, he has as much stakes in in the things that we are doing over here as, as as I'm presenting over here. So I'll be focusing on how we actually use QuestDB in house for our research, as well especially for quick prototyping in industrial IoT as well as IoT applications. And in this part, we'll just focus on one sub subtopic. That's what we call as or where by uh, most of you might know is human robot collaboration. Mm -hmm. Yep. So yeah, who we are actually. So we are, as I said, um, we are the Bremer Institute for Production and Logistics. We are actually based here in Bremen, Germany. It's in the Northwest. Um, we tend to focus a lot on research and development as well as um, concepts such as uh, quick prototyping, helping out uh, some smaller industries, SMEs, as well as taking part in huge scale European Commission projects. And we focus more, more or less on the production engineering as well as logistics part. Um, this year is our 40th year of existence. So 
yeah, that's a long number if you think about it's a big number if you think about it. And uh, I hail from a department which is called ICAP. Uh, we tend to focus a lot on um, ICT applications and how we can bring those ICT applications and tools into into production lines or into manufacturing. Uh, how to how we can help them and leverage uh, these kind of tools for SMEs. So, and we also tend to focus a lot on concepts such as product lifecycle management, uh, utilizing IIoT and digital twins in in production lines and everything. So. Um, that's one of our major competencies over here. Moving on. Um, first, let's start um, talk about why time series actually matters for someone who is in research and development and especially in production engineering. So we've tend to uh, understood from a, from a quite a, <clears throat> from from quite the experience that that the time series actually starts to matter a lot when when smaller and medium tier industries want to evolve themselves and bring in the whole industry 4.0 uh, system into their into their production line so we've we've had the opportunity of using a lot of time series data in our previous projects so one of them was how we could utilize um, time series data for example in in terms of boats if you are a boat manufacturer how you can leverage some product you uses information from your boats that are in either already out there or either in the production line or in a quick prototype phase where all you want to do is just test it around near near the waters and then try to figure out if there's some problems or not. Um, we've been using time series data quite often for tracking and tracing products, especially ones that are in the production line, how you can uh, tell, tell your end users that it's not just where the product is, but also how the product is reacting to its environment so those are some of the things that 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 we've tried to achieve also by using time series data from various sensors and actuators in the production lines and today we'll be just going through briefly over the concept of safe human robot collaboration so where um, we want to achieve let's say a, a goal where um, human personnel who, who are working in let's say industries uh, factories etc can work safely around heavy duty robotics. So we've been working on that, that part of the research uh, in, in the current times. So moving on, yeah. Um, what, like I said, what do we, why do we require human robot collaboration is one of the criteria is the fact that <clears throat> over the time factories do see, see themselves as barrier free where, for example, if you have an AGV or if you have a robotic arm, a person can actually work collaboratively with such he with such heavy duty machineries and doesn't and this does not lead to any sort of uh, haphazard uh, mistakes in such kind of production lines and production areas so that's one of the aspect that that's very critical so for example one of the important scenarios that we we always focus on the fact is how we can collaborate safely safely is the keyword over here so we try to predict scenarios where there can be a possible collision where with a, when a robotic arm moves alongside a alongside a human who's working in that same particular work area right so and then that and then try to reduce this collision uh, scenarios either by stopping the robot completely depending on how the scenario is or try to reduce the speed of the robotic arms that are working because if you think about it you can't keep on stopping the robot if the proximity between the personnel and and the robot is a little bit let's say um large because that could reduce the production um status of the of, of the industry so that's one of the, some of the things where we have to tackle these kind of things are quite challenging in that aspect we have to come up with smart algorithms smart design where where we think that 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 um, safety as well as the high production rate uh, keeps um, is being maintained throughout. So one of the challenges is indoor localization. As you most of you know that a lot of industries are indoors. So that means having a GPS on every every other component is highly unlikely, highly um, impossible in certain certain scenarios because of the industrial environment. There are lots of metallic things. A lot of things that can hamper GPS signals, and the other other thing is if you have a human human factor inside such kind of environments, you might need to understand how they are behaving, how they are working in that sense. So over here we think about how they walk, how a human walks within 
for example a premises so that's one of the challenges that we have to take take into consideration and then this is how we've gone about it so how we used um such kind of a so how we so what, what the main aim of of our uh, our research right now is how to recognize walking patterns so a walk can be different from 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 a jog can also be different for someone who's just pacing really really quickly within the area or is suddenly running or dashing into some some direction or something so in order to understand that we had to come up with some 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 basic ideas about how we can start capturing information from a human right so i mean it's not that we are we we try to emanate uh, sensoric information just naturally we have to mount some sensors on such kind of humans uh, we try to see what's the more logical solution out of it and this is what we have over here in the picture so we decided we would have an um, an iot wearable so it has an accelerometer on it which can give you accelerometer uh, values in all x y and z direction and on the other hand we we, we wanted to get some some other uh, reference values so in in this case we used a very high precision gps so one of them uh, such gps can be found from spark fun so they they tend to provide a lot of gps information uh, in a very precise manner so that we used it uh we as you can see in the figure the person actually has the gps in the hand but the iot wearable that is the m5 stick over here you can just mount it on the ankle and then it tries to track the the shocks or the the thumps that that the, the foot takes when someone is walking or running um in terms of making it much more easier and a little bit hassle free we it's quite obvious that you should think about some wireless technology so we stick to stuck to wlan and and what better way to talk about iot than using a communication protocol like mqtt right so it ten tends to serve a lot of purpose for us and then we've included that what was quite interesting is you um, as you can realize over here we had to use the gps in order to for example understand how the acceler acceleration and as well as the velocity of a human uh, can be captured while he or she or they are actually let's say running walking taking a stroll this and that so these kind of things were quite important and we had to do it somewhere outdoors and so we decided it's it's quite an interesting um challenge to to think of an edge device that can be for example outdoors in a in a let's say in a confined space and then the person can walk or do some some jogs in a certain pattern and the data that we can collect can be collected over the wireless communication medium over here so in that case we then ended up doing the using some of the components such as mosquito mqtt broker quite standard out of the box thing uh, we used telegraph because we wanted to uh, we collected a lot of information from from these two sensors and we wanted to make sure that we don't have to uh, configure reconfigure things each and every time the data just gets passed very easily into let's say influx db line protocol and then get stored into quest db which is running on our on on premises like on premises infrastructure um correct and this is all all general general stuff this just comes with intuition when you've started working with mqtt a lot you can then create certain topics to publish information from the sensors as well as control control the the let's say the the iot wearable device if you say that i'm doing a test right now for running then you can use a client to just change some configuration on the wearable and then next thing you know you're already doing the test without any hassles or without taking things on and off the the test person moving on um correct so like i said previously we used certain data points such as accelerometers ground velocity the payload was what we designed coming from these sensors was anyways in in influx db line protocol so it turns out to be very easy to understand as well as easy to program your devices so that's great help and on the other side the best at benefit of using ilp also is the fact that quest db accepts it quite easily and ingests it quite fast so one on the other hand we weren't worried about uh, of, of if we needed to do any kind of let's say processing on the device we could happily take all the raw data in from from the sensors and then decide upon post processing in the latter stages and in general just normal walks how runs and jogs that's those were the criteria that we had in mind um it turns out that it the, this whole stack that you see is quite quite great 
it took us only let's say a day and a half to figure out what we wanted to do in order to do some quick prototyping and since we had quick quest db already running on our servers it was just a matter of let's say configuring the telegraph instance to to push that data in into quest db which was um, which was hardly let's say 5 minutes time and so this thing this thing turned out really well that that means for someone uh, down the line who is a data scientist and doesn't care about um for example doesn't care about how the infrastructure is set up quest db serves a great purpose you can actually ingest all that data in from the first glance you can see over here the graph that you see over here is is an accelerometer in a certain direction and the blue graph that you see that is interpolated in that is the ground velocity so the first int intuition is the fact that okay if you are walking um you walk in a very let's say oscillating manner which makes sense if you see the accelerometers because that's very near to the ankle and just to make sure that if nothing's misconfigured we actually started to see also the ground velocity so that means whenever someone takes a turn someone stops the ground velocity reaches up to zero which means that the both the devices were great it took me it took us about 30 seconds to just plot this graph off and then we were at least assured that whatever data we are getting in is trustworthy from the device sense so and this is pretty much the great great aspect of having um quest uh, db running on our premises is the fact that it's really quick we we can try to fail early if we think that this is this something is wrong why because we can visualize it quite easily and then yeah and everything else apart from that down the line is quite easy to you can export the the data into csv for someone who is not very well equipped with apis that's great too if they we may have just lost um shan unfortunately um okay um I'm, we'll see if we can get shan uh, to rejoin the event but um otherwise what we can do is um proceed and we'll also have um a, an open session later on so hopefully we get shan back for this where he can uh, go go back into a bit more detail and also uh, answer any questions that you have um yeah up next we wanted to have a feature discussion so i would ask vlad to uh, join hi vlad thank you. thank you brian can you hear me okay yes loud and clear very cool thank you I said that's a good presentation by Sean. That's uh, pretty solid. Um it would be good to uh what well, he also does he, he, there's actual robots involved. Believe it or not. So I was waiting for um, a picture of a robot to come up but hey maybe maybe at question time, you know. Yeah, hopefully in our session he shows the <laughs> uh, the robots. Yeah. Cool. Um so we um yeah, flick yeah, clustering uh, really quickly. So um high availability generally is is a very well kind of requested uh, feature on on QuestDB and uh, to to as a database to be taken seriously uh we it's about time we actually uh, implement some high availability solutions so but uh what we also want we want to deliver something very robust um but something um we can build on so the first release isn't going to be um overly overly feature reach if i may say so so what we did we just outlined um uh goals for 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 initial release replication so uh, sorry clustering clustering there's a difference and uh, i'll uh, i'll try and highlight the difference in the next slide that contains a picture uh so the um the goals of of clustering is to uh to effectively um make uh rights highly available so uh the the idea is um to be able to for example bounce database instances without kind of write operations being ever ever interrupted so that's that's goal number one uh we also want to make reads highly available um uh and uh, that 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 could be achieved by means of uh, of of replication so creating a a copy of a data set on on another machine and uh 
that thus sort of scaling queries a kind of from between two machines or balancing the queries or perhaps executing the same query across two machines and uh, uh, the clustering the aim is to have it sort of uh, uh, fully uh, fully automated with uh, automated uh, leader election and uh, and the built-in consensus algorithm and uh, on the next slide we we have something that we kind of not including in this uh, in this clustering release the first release and if I can have Brian flick a slide, please. Thank you. Um, yeah, so um, we, right now we don't have, whoops. Yeah, so we we don't have um, sort of uh, any means to shard data, not yet. This is a, a far more complicated problem than it perhaps initially looks. So we, we're gonna postpone it until um, uh, sort of, uh, next next release or next releases, uh, and the same same thing with uh, kind of um, multi multi leader replication. So 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 in essence, basically, multi leader comes with sharding. Effectively, where is the leader per shard? Since we don't have sharding, we don't have multi leader replication either. But it's going to come eventually in in next releases. So in the next slide, we have. Uh, a funky picture. There, there we are. So, I would probably uh, encourage questions, kind of at, at some point regarding this diagram. But I'm uh, gonna try and rattle through what's what's what, right? And and what's the uh, what's the roles of this uh, of these blocks? So um, we have uh, well, the main main event here is is the the red boxes. It's a database. Kind of primary node and uh, and secondary node. So so in essence, primary node is the node that is able to update data, and and the secondary node is is the node that receives data from primary as as a copy. It, it acts as a copy. Um. So, and between uh, database nodes, uh, we have we decided to introduce uh, router nodes, right? And the router nodes is just a simple intermediary. I'm going to explain basically why we have it, why, why there's, there's no direct connection from a client to the database. But one of the major roles these router nodes do, they, uh, they effectively elect, elect the primary node. So, um, and this is sort of, uh, for, for us, it's fairly important to, to have this because uh, this router node nodes they could have consensus basically on which uh, database node is visible outside of the database nodes itself so they these router nodes can be partitioned in, in such a way that uh, they 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 kind of assume almost visibility of the client so basically um, and uh, and the the other the other role that they they perform they act as a as an intermediary between client library and the primary node. So uh, all of the data data ingress by client library is uh, is sent to the router, which and each of these three routers here they would know which primary node is uh, which one is the primary node, and the router effectively would send data to primary node. So why why do we have a hop, right? And uh, and the hop uh, in this scenario is is needed because uh, as in Flux protocol, the, that's the first protocol we we're gonna attempt to implement in in this diagram. It does not have an explicit an explicit commit generally. So as the data flows to the database, uh, we can assume let's let's assume a primary node fails, right? Then the data that is in flight. Would would essentially going to be lost, right? So if if the primary node fails, but when the data hits the router before primary node, the router would hold the data until uh, the data is saved to either of the two nodes. So it basically acts as a as a as a guard to to make sure data is not lost. And also these routers 
would be able to to transmit this the data between between each other so in case router goes down other routers have the same data and client side library will also be able to send data to any of the routers uh, they, they can be load balanced for example so any of the routers can receive the data and the router will send it to your primary node so that's the that's the basic kind of ingestion uh clustering and uh, on um on the query clustering both nodes uh will be simultaneously both database nodes um will be simultaneously available for for read operations so they can reside behind the load balancer and uh, in in simple cases uh some of the queries can go to primary some some can go to secondary and in 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 sort of in a way this this would scale um scale query capability horizontally so that's that's a, in a nutshell how we think about building clustering maybe maybe i rush it a little bit but i would like to uh take in questions and and, and maybe we can we can make this sort of project um, a collaborative effort if you guys kind of uh, have use cases that perhaps don't don't fit here or you could spot problems or anything else you want to talk about we we would like to hear it from you so that's um thanks that's a lot me. thanks bud so uh, we have one question from new schooler already who's asked oh, wow. if high, high availability removes the need for database backups um well yes and no so we generally you could use high availability to remove uh, kind of need for backup but for example um the high availability would not fully protect the data from um for example bad data penetrations for example like the, the, when we have updates you, you could go and update a primary node and this update would propagate to secondary node and uh, and your data is going to be overwritten right on both nodes without any kind of failure so backup in a, in in a nutshell creates sort of a point in, of point in time snapshot of the data that cannot be modified after the backup is taken so it's kind of um not fully so it doesn't the clustering doesn't remove a need for a backup per se yeah um, so I think what we can do now also is move to the session and there um, all of our guests can also share video and uh, chat with us directly. So Vlad, you also mentioned about, about the clustering feature that this would be good to also get some feedback from uh, the community and that's maybe we Absolutely. can take it over to the session there and we can have a, an open floor. And also I think we have Shan back with us so we can Oh, we can, we can see a robot. We can pick up, yes, hopefully. Um, so with that, then I'll, I'll close the stage session and I'll see you all over at the session.